oh, don't worry if you're Vietnamese, but when in the first session, this session is the same. All right, let's get started. So welcome everyone to the fourth webinar of the series. Today we'll be talking about how to improve your student participation in your lessons. Uh, so welcome everyone, wherever you are. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so you are now halfway through your webinar series. So I'm sure you have learned lots of useful information and advice from the last month. And let's get started. So my name is Bryony. I'm originally from England, but I've been living in Spain for the last five years. I have worked with EF since 2016. I started in Madrid as an English teacher and worked my way up to senior teacher before I was an academic manager this summer in Hastings which is a town in England. Uh, so I have lots of experience working with both adults and teenagers with EF. I also recently completed my Delta qualification. So have spent a long time researching and experimenting with lots of different parts of English language teaching. And I discovered a lot of new activities which are very useful for increasing the level of participation in your lesson. And some of you may recognize me from your second webinar of the series um, about how to improve your board work. So it's nice that I'm able to do the second one for you and continue giving you some advice. So, I want you to answer this question in the chat box. Why do some of your students participate less than others in class? Just want you to write, why do you think that? Good, we've got some answers coming already. You can see people are saying they're shy or timid or are afraid to speak English. Some of them are lazy, good idea or no motivation, good. I can see someone saying they don't like English. Good, there's lots of the edges. Afraid of making mistakes, that's a huge one. And feeling like they'll be judged by their classmates. Excellent, thank you for sharing those ideas. I've got some ideas which I thought of. A lack of interest in the topic. Oh, I've just seen someone wrote hungry. Yes, that can definitely affect your level of participation. We also have no motivation. Maybe the groupings they're in. Maybe something to do with their partner or with other classmates. Shyness or a lack of confidence. And finally, I've written the atmosphere. Perhaps the atmosphere in the classroom makes them less likely to participate in the lesson itself. So these are things which we will talk about today. Um, thank you very much for all your answers because I didn't include afraid of the wrong answer and that's a very good one to include. So another question, what type of classes typically have lower levels of participation? So if you want to write that, what type of classes? Mm -hmm. And also what type of student? I want you to think about ages as well. Okay, a lot of people are saying beginner or low level classes. Mm -hmm. What about the age? Good, now I'm seeing teenagers. Maybe adolescents don't participate as much. Mm -hmm. Young adults, good. 
So a couple of the things I wrote down were teenager. Oh, sorry. Let me just go back. Apologies. Let me just go back to that last slide. So I wrote teenagers, young adults, and lower levels, as you can see down here. And typically, these students haven't chosen to be in their lessons, but they are, are obliged to be in class because it's a compulsory subject at that school, or perhaps because their parents or their family have paid for them to do an English course. So they are typically less motivated to participate in the lesson. So in this webinar, we will talk about various aspects of the things you can see on this slide and how we can help those students to participate more. So I am going to talk about how to interest your students, giving your students a little bit of what they like does them good. I'll explain more during this presentation. Making receptive tasks active. And also we'll talk about praising your students. And I'm gonna give you lots of activities and ideas you can use in the classroom, which will prompt higher levels of participation. So let's get started. Interest your students. I want you to tell me, how can I find out what my students are interested in? What different activities do you know? Mm -hmm. Good ideas. T uh, questionnaires, a needs analysis, asking them, okay. brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Good questionnaires again. All right, yes, an icebreaker to let your students get to know each other. Good, lots of great ideas, thank you. So how to get to know your class? I recommend questionnaires or a survey, as you might say, uh, where students write down what they're interested in. This can be included in a needs analysis at the beginning of a course. You could ask your students to write an autobiography in which they tell you a little bit about their lives and they might include some details about what they're interested in. You can also, maybe in the questionnaire, ask them to rank different topics from what they are most to least interested in. The information you get from these will help you to prepare personalized lessons and activities for your students. This means they will be more engaged in your lessons. And when students are engaged, they participate and they want to be involved. So it's very important that we talk about topics which interest our students. So I have another question for you. Think of one of your classes or one of your groups of students. What is one topic they are really interested in? For example, one of my evening classes, a group of teenagers, love Harry Potter. They're obsessed with Harry Potter. So I try to include Harry Potter references in my classes to keep them interested. They are always more engaged and more willing to do exercises when they notice I'm trying to include information that interests them. So let's see, what are you writing? What topics? Good, we've got a real mix. Shopping, civil engineering, computer games, travel. Ah, oh, I see someone else has also got Harry Potter. Fashion, good. Mm-hmm. Good, um, I'm going to save questions for the end. I can see some people are writing questions. Please save them for the end 
because I will I want to um, answer them for you. Um, all right. So interesting your students. Motivation is key to getting your students to participate. This is why we include topics which we know our students are interested in. So, I think it's very important to give our students a choice about what to learn. It will motivate them, they will be engaged, and then they will participate in my lesson. What you can see here is an activity which you can give your students in which they must rank or prioritize their most, the writing they are most interested in. For example, you can see a diary, an email, essays, we got lists and postcards. Our students don't necessarily need to know how to cut, write all these different genres. So by asking our students to fill out an exercise or a table like this, we can find out what is most important for them. I can then take this information and make sure we prioritize that in the lesson. For example, if I'm teaching an adult business class, it's unlikely that they will be wanting to write lots of postcards. So I expect them to write more things like emails or perhaps instructions or maybe even reports. So my students can tell me what they are most interested in. This activity can be adapted for lots of different lesson aims and types. For example, can you write in the chat box different types of listenings that I could include in this box? Podcasts, good, news reports, some videos as well, songs. Good, films, videos, news, conversation as well would be an idea. Good. And I can also do the same with topics. Students can rank their topics from most to least interested. And I can explain to my students, I'm doing this activity to find out what you like so that we can include it in our lessons. But you can also remind them that as the teacher, there are some topics which you must cover because they are in the book, but you are going to use the information they have given you to tailor the course or personalize the course to what they are most interested in. Now, of course, if you have a big class, this can be more difficult. So it's important to explain to them that you want to make classes which most people or as many people as possible are interested in but students may not be interested in every single topic. This will still engage them because they know that you will cover topics that they are interested in during the course at some point. So by explaining to your students how you're choosing these different topics they will notice that you care about how they feel and about what they want. And this again will help create a more comfortable atmosphere. Like we mentioned at the beginning, it will make an atmosphere where the students feel comfortable. All right, let's move on to my next section. A little of what they like does them good. This means doing activities which your students enjoy and which your students like doing. So as a teacher, it's very important to find out what they like so you can ensure they are enjoying the learning experience, which in turn motivates them and encourages them to participate. So I want you to think what fun experiences in the classroom are most memorable to you? For example, I remember, oh, sorry, it happened again. There we go, apologies. 
I remember one class when a teacher was studying the topic of crime and she turned her classroom into a crime scene. Now, all the students enjoyed this class so much because it was interactive. They could imagine themselves in the situation and they participated a lot more than a sort of more traditional style of teaching. So let's see what people are writing. You know your students like role plays or watching under watching films and trying to understand what people are saying. Yes, of course, games. Uh, find someone who story tells. Good, maybe with business classes, doing presentations. So you all sound like you know your students very well. And this is important so you can include this type of activities which they enjoy most, which will encourage them to participate. Great, I love all these ideas. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an example of a couple of creative ideas which you can use in your classroom, which will promote participation. So the first one is creating a travel agency. In pairs, your students can create a 10-day travel itinerary for a holiday. You can give out different types of holiday, for example, a city holiday or an active holiday, beach holiday, and so on. Students must decorate their desk with different features of a travel agency. As you can see in this photo, they've created a leaflet or a poster. And you can actually just see at the bottom, there's also some flowers because the students were, I think, selling a trip to Hawaii or Miami even. I think I can see in the picture. Once the students have organized their leaflets and their desks and their travel itinerary, you split the class in half. One student stays at the desk and acts as the travel agent, whilst the other acts as a person interested in going on a holiday. That person has 10 minutes to visit different travel agencies around the class, asking questions, finding out about the price and about the special um, parts of each itinerary. Then students swap roles and do the same thing. They repeat. At the end of the activity, students come back together in their pairs and discuss which holidays they want to go on the most and why. Then your students can vote for which holiday they want to go on and the students can see how successful their itinerary was. Now this is great because all students must participate. I first in the planning section up here, then when one stays at the desk and the other visits the other travel agencies and afterwards when they discuss their reasons for what they like. And again, I think someone's written this. Everyone loves the topic of traveling. So it will really engage and create a fun environment in your classroom. Another problem we mentioned at the beginning is sometimes the groupings or the pairings of students doesn't encourage participation. So we need to use mingle activities. This means Students can move around and talk to different members of the classroom. In this particular activity, after studying a certain topic or language, um, they write one question related to that topic on a piece of paper. For example, if the topic was the city, they could write, do you like living in a big city or in a small town? Or if the language focus was superlatives, their question could be, what is the fastest animal on the earth? Then students stand up and ask their question to the nearest person. They discuss each other's answers and then swap papers. Then students must go find a new classmate to talk to with the new question. So they don't keep their old question. You can then continue this. You tell everyone you need to swap five times and speak to five people. And this is a great way of students 
interacting with other members of the class. They may prefer this so that they are not always talking to the person next to them. So it's a great way to get them to mingle. And it also helps uh, because they're not talking about the same question every time. They have a different discussion with each person. So that's a great activity. Also, it takes the pressure off students. They aren't speaking in front of the whole class. They can have private conversations with one other student, take their own time, they can make some mistakes and not have the entire class hear them. So it's a great activity for maybe shyer students who aren't comfortable talking in front of the whole class. So these are two great activities which both require mandatory participation in order to complete the task. Something else which is very important. <clears throat> so let's move on to my next topic, which is always make receptive tasks active. Can you just write in the chat box, what are the two receptive skills? Excellent. We've got people saying reading and listening. That's exactly what I wanted. Often, these can be viewed as a very passive skill. You listen whilst reading, uh, sorry, you listen or you read. And perhaps you're not as involved because you're not producing any language. But this is a classroom and we want our students to participate and engage with the material. So we need them to feel involved because sitting passively doesn't encourage them to participate. It's very important to give students a reason to read or listen to something. I've seen many teachers say, watch this interesting video or read this article from the newspaper without giving the students a reason to read or listen. This doesn't actively engage your students. So it's important to say instructions like, watch the video and write down what five different sports the man talks about. This means students will engage in the listening process. They will be listening for details. So it's very important to give students a reason to do this. Next, it's also important to generate interest in a topic so that students will actively engage with the topic. For example, imagine your students are about to read an article about a jewellery robbery in Paris. How can you generate interest? Give me some examples. Good, I can see some pre-listening activities. Using pictures, wonderful. Um, we're not going to talk about speaking because speaking is a receptive skill. We're just talking about uh, a productive, sorry. We're just talking about receptive skills right now. Pictures matching activities. Mm -hmm ask questions, predictions, that's a great one. Bring the stolen jewellery, um, good idea. Uh, dramatize, some brainstorm, excellent. Rearrange the images in the correct order of the story, very good. So some of my answers were you could get them to brainstorm, what happened, brainstorm potential language that might come up in the listening, oh, sorry, reading, reading, apologies everyone, in the reading. You could use visuals, so students must guess what's happening. They can make predictions from the headline, or you could bring in realia. This means physical objects that students can generate ideas about the article from, which is exactly what someone suggested, so well done. 
bringing in the stolen jewellery. Um, this will generate interest in the topic and it will also help students predict some of the language that will come up in the reading, which helps them to engage with the topic and then later to be able to discuss it. Mm -hmm. And all of these things also increase participation. Students aren't just reading, but they're discussing, they're predicting, and they are interacting with each other. So now I would like to give you some example ideas for reading, which will increase participation in the lesson. My first activity is a jigsaw reading. In a jigsaw reading, students work in groups or pairs and each student has a different part of the text. They have to share the information which they have read with their group in order to understand the whole story. So without the information which their partner has, they will not be able to understand. So again, this provokes mandatory participation because students need to share what information they have read. Another activity is a keyword summary. So again, we're going to divide our text into sections and give each group one section. Students read the text and can write down eight keywords from the text. Then they form new groups and these new groups have one member from each of the previous groups. They take their eight keywords with them and then they need to summarize their section of the text to the, new to the new group using their keywords. So for your students who don't feel as confident in English or maybe are a bit shyer, they have those eight words to support them when they're doing their summary. It can really help your students if they have just a few ideas to take with them so that the next step isn't as overwhelming um, as it would be without those keywords. You can then follow up this activity with a comprehension exercise in which the students must collaborate on to complete because each of them knows their section the best. So they must collaborate with each other to answer all the questions. And the third activity I have is called, what did I change? So imagine your students have just read a text. In pairs, they choose one part of the text they've just read and copy it down onto a piece of paper. But they change one piece of information. For example, if you read these two sentences, as she turned the corner, she heard the faint howl of a dog. Or number two, as she turned the corner, she heard the loud howl of a dog. Can everyone please tell me what the difference in this sentence is? Exactly, I've changed my adjective from faint to loud. So students would then leave these pieces of paper on their desk and as a pair, they circulate the room and read the other pieces of paper on their classmates' desks. And when they're reading, they need to work out how each sentence has been changed. Now remember, students are choosing one part or one phrase from the text they've read. The likelihood is that all the pairs will choose a different section or they will choose a different part of the sentence to change. For example, instead of changing the adjective, maybe they could have changed the verb or even the animal at the end of it. So it's a good activity because students participate and interact with each other at the beginning. They're interacting with the text again and then they have to figure out how each section has changed a great activity which involves different types of participation. So those are my reading ideas. Now let's look at my 
listening ideas. The first activity, listen and describe. In this activity, the teacher tells a story, but stops regularly and asks the students to write or give a description of what she ha he or she has just said. For example, when I entered the building, I was amazed at the spectacular decoration. Okay, students, what did the inside of the building look like? Some of the students might write down it had marble statues. Others might talk about a mosaic on the floor or the elaborate door or windows. So this engages the students as they all write down their own personal idea or opinion. Or if you don't want them to write it, you can elicit or brainstorm different ideas. So it's a great way to get students participating while they listen to you tell a story. Another activity, an information transfer activity. In this one, students must complete a drawing, a table or a diagram based on the information they hear. For example, you could give your students a blank diary page, which they must fill in with their partner's schedule. <coughs> Students take it in turn asking each other questions about their week. So maybe you are practicing either vocabulary for activities or maybe you're practicing times of the day. Um, and at the end, once it's finished, you can compare people's schedules in the class. So it's a great way to participate and practice another skill whilst also practicing the listening skill. So you're actively listening and engaged. My final activity uh, for listening is a hidden picture. In this activity, you split your class in half and give one half a photo of a house, for example. But each photo is different. You might have a bigger house, a smaller house, one with more windows, different colours, a garden, a car in front of it. So different photos. These students describe their photo to a partner and the partner must take notes. Once they're finished, the teacher takes all the photos and puts them on the board or on the wall. And the students who wrote the notes must go look at the different pictures and match their notes to the pictures. So again, actively engaging them in the listening skill. They cannot just listen passively and not take in the ideas. They need to write things down. They need to remember, they need to understand. All of these help to increase participation. Oops, sorry, I'll just leave it there. Um, because students must respond to what they've listened to. So in a little summary of this section, remember to make your receptive task active. During these activities, students have no choice. They must participate in order to complete the tasks. This means everyone, not only the students who are stronger or more confident. But as you have seen, not all of the activities make students answer questions in front of the whole class. So you need to decide which ones your students will like or respond well to. So moving on to my next section. Oh, and there's my book and my listening. My next section is about praise. Can everyone please write what types of things should you praise your students for in the classroom? Let's get some ideas. Great, loads of ideas. So for trying, improvement, for their marks, project work, mm -hmm, the things they've just learned. Mm -hmm, smiles, great. It's always good to encourage positive learning behaviours. 
Good for being active. So that's what we're talking about today, participation. So make sure you praise participation as well as achievement. It's very easy just to notice good use of language and praising achievement. But as we said at the beginning, get to know your class, get to know your students individually. Which students are shyer normally, but today are making an effort and are participating more than normal? Which one of your passive teenagers is making an effort today because they're engaged with what you're teaching? And praise them. But how do we praise? I've got some different things. Um, uh, well, actually, first, let's answer this question. How would you feel if you were a shy student and only the highest level students in your class received praise? How would you feel? Good, upset, disappointed, ignored, demotivated. Exactly, you would feel like you weren't as good as the other students. And if you feel demotivated or upset or having no confidence, do you think you will be motivated to participate in the lesson? No, good, lots of no's coming through. You're not gonna be encouraged to participate. So we as the teachers in the classroom are responsible for creating an atmosphere and an environment in which our students do feel comfortable and like their points and their opinions are just as valued as the students who have higher levels in the class. So effective praise can provide students with positive reinforcement that motivates them and increases their participation in the class. The key word here is effective praise. We need to make sure that we are praising our students effectively and in the correct way. And an important aspect of this is targeting genuine effort and achievement. It's very common for students to say, good work, uh, for teachers to say, good work, good job to your students. But it doesn't sound very genuine if it's about all anything. So we need to be specific. Comments like great work is too generic. So we need to be specific. For example, if we are praising people for their participation levels, we need to say, great, your point was really interesting, or thank you for sharing your idea. That's been really helpful. So make sure that you are being specific with your praise. It also shows that you care about your students' learning, which can be an important motivating factor. If you say, good job, good job, it doesn't sound truthful, or maybe it sounds like you are exaggerating all the time. It's not as meaningful if you repeat it a lot. So make sure you're being, you're targeting genuine achievement and effort, and also authentically. So there we go. We've got some information about praise there. So I would like to re recap what I have talked about in this webinar. Can you tell me, how can I improve my student participation? Mm -hmm. Encourage tailor-made lessons, good. So interest them. Mm -hmm. What was the second point I talked about? What was the next one? Mm -hmm. Good. Engaging activities. Good. Be creative. So a little of what your students like does them good. It encourages them to participate. What did I talk about next? Okay. 
You remember I talked about certain skills. Good, receptive skills. So make sure your receptive skills and tasks are active. You are actively engaging your students so that they're not just watching a video but not listening or they're not staring out the window. And finally, I said at the end, good, praise. Make sure we praise participation as well as achievement. Don't fall into the trap of just praising correct sentences or um, high marks. Praise participation. All your students are different. And there's one thing I really want to focus on is remember that motivation is key to participation. Without being motivated, if you're disappointed, if you're sad, if you're bored, you aren't encouraged as a student to participate in lessons. So remember, motivate our students. All right, I'm now going to give you an opportunity to ask me any questions that you've had during this webinar. So we're going to do 10 minutes of questions, but please stay in the room because at the end, I'm going to display a question which you need to answer to prove your attendance to this webinar. So please, can you write your question and I will do my best to answer as many as I can. And we've got 10 minutes saved. Good, what about big classes? This is a good question because yes, it's more difficult to get your students to, for example, mingle because they are crowded. I think you can still do mingling activities, but you need to set up your activities very clearly. You need to tell your students, perhaps if there's not enough space to move around, you could get them to sit in a circle um, in certain groups and that they talk to people in those circles. Then you as the teacher, can monitor these different circles and you don't have students running around the entire class. Another idea if you've got a big class to get them to participate is to do like a speed dating line where you've got one line of students moving in one direction and the other in another direction so that again you don't have students moving everywhere you can have them standing up or sitting down um, but they still have that opportunity to participate. Mm -hmm. What other questions? What can I do when my students don't like English? This is when questionnaires and needs analysis are not only for the beginning of a course. You can do questionnaires and surveys at any point during a course. So to motivate students who don't like learning English, Find out what topics they like in their personal life. Do they like sports? Do they like culture? And engage with them about those, those topics to help motivate them for their learning. And explain to them, as the teacher, you want to interest them and pick topics that they like, but that they also need to engage with the lesson in order to improve. Again, this is a good question. What should I do if students think English is not important? Uh, this does happen. Um, and perhaps they feel like it's not important in their life. Um, but you can, again, have a brainstorming session and ask them to think about in what ways is English useful? What can English give them? And they might say, oh, I can watch films. I can listen to popular music, I can travel, and try and identify which of these branches, whilst brainstorming, interest them the most, um, is what I would say about students who aren't interested in learning English. Mm -hmm. All right. How how can we motivate lower level classes? I can see we've got a couple of questions about this. 
Um, sometimes lower levels can feel very demotivated about their level. So in this one, it's very important to create that atmosphere in which students feel comfortable. Um, so being careful about your own language level as the teacher, make sure you don't speak too quickly or in too complicated a manner. Um, and also building students up and helping them succeed in the lesson. So maybe you start with images, which students can relate to. They see images. Images are in every language. They don't have a language. So they, students can engage with those pictures first. It can be more visual. And then maybe you can brainstorm vocabulary. And so that you're slowly building those activities up as they become more complex during the lesson. All right, I'm afraid that is all we have time for. So I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. I hope you have got some useful advice and activities from it. Um, I recommend trying some of them in your lessons this week. Before you leave, in order to prove your attendance, you need to click on this link here. Here's the link and answer this question below. What is key to participation? Is it the type of skill being worked in the class? Is it the level of your students or is it motivation? Uh, so please don't answer here. Click the link and write your answer the, there so that you can get your final certificate at the end of the series. So please don't answer in the chat. You need to click the link in order to answer the question. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending this webinar. And best of luck with the rest of your course. Thank you. Bye.